Welcome to the Story A Day podcast. This is Julie Duffy from storyaday.org, encouraging you to be a writer every day, not someday. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Julie from Story A Day here with the Story A Day podcast. And this week I wanted to talk about seven things I learned from writing a story a day in 2023. Now, I started this journey in 2010 and I learned a bunch of things back then and I've talked about them a lot over the years. And every year I learn new things, but quite often I end up learning the same thing over and over again. 13 years in, I'm starting to notice some patterns Whether you are a writer with your own practice, who's just looking for ways to improve, tips and tricks you can steal from other writers, whether you are a writer who's just starting out or just someone who wants to make yourself more productive, more creative and more fulfilled, stick with me while I talk you through seven of the things that I learned about in Story A Day May this year. Now, thing zero is that it takes a little time to recover and synthesize and absorb all the lessons from a challenge like that. That's why this message is coming to you a couple of weeks after the end of Story A Day May and not immediately afterwards. So if you haven't yet done all the things that you had planned to do in early June after writing a Story A Day in May, chill. You need some recovery time. You need time to catch up with all the household things that got put aside while you were having your creative outburst. Maybe this is a busy time of year because of graduations or exams or gardening or field work or whatever it is. So just let's take a breath and understand that we're going to be in this for a long time and there's no rush. And let's take a moment, though, also to look back. And as I talk about the seven things that I pulled out of my Story A Day May experience, I'd love for you to be thinking about what you learn when you go on a big writing push. What's real for you right now and what's changed, what's likely to change in future? What are the good bits that you can keep and what are the things that you can let go of? So let's get started with the seven things. Thing one is the discovery, and it happens every year. It's one of the reasons I keep coming back and doing story a day every year. I always learn that I can write about anything. You can write about anything. You really can. And the prompts that we put out here at story a day during the challenge are intended to prove that to you. They're intended to push you and they're intended to make you write things that aren't in your usual rut. And whether or whether you love prompts or whether you hate prompts or think you hate prompts, give them a try because I hear every year from people, every almost every day of the challenge, I hear from people who surprise and delight themselves. I didn't know I could write romance. I didn't know what I was going to do with this prompt. And I've ended up with something that I really quite like. People surprise themselves with the weird little stories they go on, with the tangents they go on, with the tone the story takes. Everything about being limited by the prompt squeezes the creativity out of your pen, out of your fingers, out of your brain. And it's amazing how this writing talent that we have, which we've worked on and cr- to make it a, a skill and which we use to craft stories, is applicable to anything. The common denominator is us, our curiosity, our brain, our creativity. And somebody gives us a topic and tells us we must write a story about it, We will surprise ourselves and there's nothing more delightful than surprising yourself. Surprising and delighting yourself is a really important part of life. I've had people in the Story A Day Challenge from the age of 12 and I have people in the Story A Day Challenge every year into their 80s and even their 90s. The first year we had a lady who was in her 90s. I think it's hugely important for us to keep surprising ourselves. Thing number two that I learned from Story A Day this year is that structure is freeing. This is something that I have learned before. It's something I resist learning. I, like possibly many of you, am one of those people who feels like they don't want to be hemmed in. I don't want to be told what to do. I'm a rebel. I don't think you can be 
dedicated to creativity and the kind of person who accepts the rules all the time. I just don't think those two things go together. I'm a rules follower in many ways, but for that creativity to flourish, you have to be willing to look at the world and say, but why? But why is it like that? But is that right? Are, why does it work that way? Should it work that way? And so when somebody tells you that you need to be disciplined and you need structure in your life, our creative brains tend to rebel against that and go, no, I don't. But of course, what I learn every year and every time I get into a project and determine that I'm going to make some progress, every single time I discover that structure actually helps. Structure makes it possible for the weird little creatures to come out and play. They're safe, they're in a safe little enclosure and then they can play in my brain. I was also the kind of writer who thought that I could only write at a particular time of day or in a particular way or when I was in a particular mood and it turns out that is not true. Turning up every morning and writing first thing worked really well for me with the way that my life is at the moment. If you have to get up and go out to a job, that's probably not going to work that well for you. But if you say every day after dinner, I'm going to sit down and write, you start to learn to do that. If you say every day I'm going to start and finish a story for a month, that becomes one, two, three fewer decisions that you have to make. So structure, yes. Rigid structure, not so much. I think that the scaffolding that we put around our work has to be responsive to who you are. If you can't write first thing in the morning, don't force it. I think about this a little bit like earthquake resistant construction or trees that can survive in a high wind. The trees that can survive in a high wind have a kind of open lattice work of branches that let that bend and flex with the the wind so they're not uprooted in the strongest of winds except in exceptional circumstances. I think about earthquake construction because there's lots of diff earthquake resistant building construction. There's lots of different techniques they use. It's not just about making the building flexible. It's about stopping it from collapsing. It's about transferring some of the motion into heat. Lots of fascinating stuff to dig into um, once you start investigating that. But the fact is, the best way to build an earthquake resistant building is not to build it in an earthquake zone. And the best way to not be stressed about your writing is to just not do this stupid, difficult thing we do, which is trying to invent whole worlds out of our heads and then put them into words in ways that will be interesting and gripping for other people. It's a difficult thing that we choose to do and we choose to do it and we're not going to stop choosing to do it. So we put supports around that are flexible, that are fit for purpose. You would not put the same supports around a building in a flood zone that you would put around a building in an earthquake zone. We keep building on both those places, by the way. But the supports and the safety systems that you put in place are different for each. If you are a particular type of writer or particular type of person, you need a different type of structure to support that. Even from project to project, your supports might change. So just don't immediately rule out the idea of structure, but remind yourself that structure can also be flexible and responsive. You have to give it a shot. You have to give it a chance to be make sure it's fit for purpose. And if it's not, you get to tweak it. You don't have to use somebody else's structure. You don't have to use a structure that worked for you in the past. You get to upgrade and iterate with all the new knowledge you have. And how do you gain new knowledge? By doing the thing, by writing more. Number two was structure is freeing as long as it's not too rigid. Number three is related to that, which is writing a story every day doesn't have to be daily. I keep hoping that one year I'm going to prove myself wrong and that I'm going to find writing a new story every day for 31 days on the trot, an absolute delight, and it's going to be wonderful. And every year I find that at least by the second Sunday of the month, 
I really want that Sunday off. I really want a day off where I can just think, I can zig instead of zagging, I can think sideways, I can relax, I can let my brain come up with some new ideas. So even though this is my own challenge, and it's my challenge to you to write a story a day in May, I don't think I have ever once actually done it because it makes me miserable. What I do is what I tell you to do, which is set your own rules. And this year I set my rule that I wasn't going to take any days off and I realised, no, I am. So I've also over the years adapted the rules to say, why don't you like see how you do for a week and decide if the rules you set before you'd even tried it are going to serve you for week two. And then are those rules that you set in week two going to serve you for week three? Because the point of this is not to grind your way through some kind of, what is it, tough mudder race where you're just miserable but you get some hero's reward at the end. That's not the point. The point of a challenge like this is to discover how you're going to build a writing practice that fits your life. So for me, every year, no matter how optimistic I am, I just have to accept the fact that I'm going to want Sundays off. And so next year, please remind me before it starts so that I don't have to put this back in my list again of things that I've learned in Story A Day May. Thing number four, it doesn't have to feel hard. I know we all have this image in our head of the tortured artist and that we're digging into our deepest, darkest emotions and that we're wrestling with the words and it can only be good if we've wrestled and wrangled and begged and, and moulded the words the way we want them. But actually, sometimes the stuff that comes easily is the good stuff. Sometimes if it's easy and funny or easy and dark or easy and straightforward, then that's you writing the good stuff. Just because it comes easily to you doesn't mean it's not going to be enjoyable for other people. Nobody else inhabits your brain. What is easy for you is a revelation to other people. There are people who every year write stories during Story A Day May and they say, hi, you know that one? That one I think doesn't need much work. That one's ready to go. It's not every day and it's not every writer, but every year several people write several stories that just came. This one just came. This one just flowed and it's usually not on day one either. So it doesn't have to be hard. Tapping into what is unique about you should be easy. And so when you, the, the, the deeper you tap <laughs> that well, the, the more unique your writing is going to be. And it's important to enjoy it a little bit because parts of what we do are so hard that if you can enjoy the parts that come easily and not worry that because it's coming easily, it can't be good, that's not true. Then you get to actually enjoy this as well as wrangling with the hard parts, which is, of course, number five. Sometimes it is hard because anything worth doing is usually hard. Anyone can start a story. Anyone can say I'm going to write a story a day for a month. Anyone can say I'm going to write a novel. Anyone can say I've got an idea for a novel. Doing anything hard has hard bits in it. Right? it it's a cliche to say if it was easy, everyone would be doing it, but that's true. So sometimes we get to enjoy the easy part and sometimes it's hard and, and that's okay. Sometimes you sit down to write and it is rubbish and it is like pulling teeth to try and get through it. There is a huge benefit to learning to work through that and write anyway. I have multiple writer friends who hand me whose finished drafts I read and I go, oh my goodness, you're so great. This is so amazing. I can't imagine how you did this. And then I've, I've ended up reading their first drafts later on. And sometimes when I read these writers first drafts, I go, oh man, what happened? They've lost it. I thought they were a good writer. Maybe they're not a good writer. And then I watch as they throw out dead ends, they throw out chapters where they wandered down a dead end, they, th they go back in and they turn a really pedestrian scene into something that crackles. And I go, oh, that's how you do it. You keep writing 
through the bits that are hard, the bits that are not magic, and you keep writing until the story's done. And then you take all of your brilliance and you go back in and you cut out all the stuff that you needed to write to help you get there. And you take out the bits that don't fit, that don't matter, the bits that, that were a slog to write. And maybe not all of the bits that were a slog to write, some of them might stay in. But it has been very interesting to watch some really talented writers over many really talented writers over the years take a draft that I thought was kind of meh and turn it into something by persisting, by not giving up when it got difficult. And these are not all A-type people with law degrees. These are some neurodivergent weirdos out there who are managing to get this done. And so brave heart, my neurodivergent weirdo friends, it can be done if you want to. But it is important not to not to question yourself when it gets difficult or not to question yourself when your story hasn't found its home yet because sometimes it's hard. And that is lesson five from this year's Story A Day challenge for me. Some of the stuff I wrote was hard because I was just slogging to get to the end of the story. And then I went back and looked at it and I went, ah, there's something, there's promise. Something's happening in the story. Okay, so I know that's only five of the seven things I promised to talk about that I learned from Story A Day this year, but I realised that I've been talking for my allotted 15 minutes and I really want to go deeply into the next two lessons because I think they were really important. So I am going to do a cliffhanger and you're going to have to wait until next week to find out what were the two most important things I learned during Story A Day. Hopefully the things that I've talked about already have resonated with you and I would love to have you come over to the blog at storyaday.org forward slash episode 289 and leave your comment about what worked for you and what you've learned doing writing challenges. You may have already done this at the end of the challenge or on the, the swagger post at the beginning of June but if you haven't captured the lessons from your latest big writing push yet use this opportunity to come to storyaday.org forward slash episode 289. If you would like to dive a little deeper into the craft of short story writing, I'm going to recommend that you take a look at my three day challenge. It's kind of a misnomer. It's a little mini course on short story writing. You don't have to do it in three days. You certainly don't have to finish every lesson in a single day, but that's just kind of my thing to say three day challenge, right? So you'll write three different stories during it. And on the first day, we'll focus on the craft of openings. And then day two, we will examine the messy middle and how to get through that. And on day three, we'll look at how to put a killer ending on your story. And there's some bonus content in there that people have told me is worth the price of admission alone. So do check out the three day challenge if you haven't already done that. It's at storyaday.org forward slash three DC. That's the numeral three, a D and a C. I will come back next week with a way for you to participate in the Story A Day May challenge, even if you missed it this year. I know a lot of people were busy in May. I certainly was. Some people asked me if there was a way for them to kind of time shift the year and, and, and start the challenge again later in the year. So I'm working on that and I should have it ready by next week. So if you would like to go through the challenge as if you were starting on May the 1st, you won't have the benefit of a whole group of people going through it together if you do it that way, but you can still come to the blog and leave your comments as if you were going through it in May and you can always recruit from people to go through it with you. So I'll have more information about that for you next week. So come back for the last two lessons I learned, two big lessons I learned from writing Story A Day May this year. Check out storyaday.org forward slash 3dc if you want to go more deeply into the craft of writing stories and tune in next week to find out how you can do a do-it-yourself anytime story a day may 2023 there's so much going on i have so much for you most of all though keep writing thanks for listening why not come over to the blog at storyaday.org and check out this week's writing prompts and articles. And in the meantime, have a great creative week and of course, keep writing.